Walker. Carolyn Lazard Opening Day Talk, with Curator Pavel Pish, February 12, 2022. Well, welcome. My name is Pavel Pish. I'm a curator in the Visual Arts Department at the Walker Art Center. For those listening in, I'm a white male with blonde hair. I'm wearing a face mask and a cardigan, uh, a soft cardigan. And I'm speaking to you seated in the cinema here at the Walker in Minneapolis, Minnesota, located on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary homelands of the Dakota people. This site, which was once an expansive marshland, holds meaning for the Dakota, the Ojibwe, and other indigenous people who still live here today. So before I speak further, I will pass over to Carolyn Lazard to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Carolyn. I'm going to describe myself. I'm a light-skinned black person. I'm wearing cornrows that feel like train tracks, and my sweater is very fuzzy, and I'm wearing like black, kind of crispy, but soft pants. Um, so for today's talk, we will be in conversation for about 40 to 45 minutes. We will take questions. Please feel free to drop them into the Q&A function. Today's talk includes ASL interpretation, and you can turn on captions by pressing the closed captioning button. If you're using audio description, please call the number posted in the chat to be connected to our audio description feed. And if you have any issues at all with um, any of the access, please feel free to contact either Sarah or Mackenzie, who are um, on today's webinar. So um, this is an unusual conversation, because usually we would have an opening day talk, and typically people will have seen the show. It's a little different today. We have many more people listening in who have not experienced the exhibition. So I think maybe we could start by talking about how this show came about and specifically how you responded to the invitation to make a show at The Walker. And then maybe you could describe a little bit what the show is like. Yeah, sure. Um, so <laughs> I think when I started working on this project, you know, I started in, from a really different direction. I wasn't really thinking about making something responsive to this institution and, and this site. But increasingly, I find it really challenging to not make work that is in some way responsive to the site that the work is, um, you know, being displayed in or held in. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I kind of pivoted. I started thinking a bit about the Walker's history, and I started to really focus on uh, the Walker's relationship to dance and performance as kind of like one of the large institutions in the U.S. that really championed this work early on. Um, before many other institutions decided to kind of fund and support and show dance and performance works. Um, so yeah, in some ways I wanted to think a little bit more about that relationship and some of the, you know, the big dancers and performers who have been supported by the Walker over the years. Some like archives and works are here, thinking about Merce Cunningham and Trisha Brown and Yvonne Rayner and so forth. So that, I remember there was a moment when we started working together, there was a particular idea and then there was a hard turn, <laughs> which was exciting. Yeah. Um, and then the show came about really you thinking, I mean, the show is not in, res in reference to any particular person or thread of history, but really thinking about that whole um, heritage in a way and responding to it. So the exhibition, which is called Long Take, is very immersive and there are individual works within the show but it really is an environment to be experienced so maybe we could talk a little bit about each of the elements in mm -hmm. the gallery space so you've transformed the gallery completely by covering it in a work called surround sound yeah so um yeah that's sort of the <laughs> <laughs> literal, I mean, it's like the foundation of the entire exhibition. It's a work called Surround Sound. Uh, it's made of marley floor, which are vinyl mats that are traditionally used in dance rehearsal spaces and stages and so forth. You're normally not supposed to or allowed to walk on them in those places when like wearing shoes. Um, so this is a little bit different because it's sort of meant to be walked on and get scuffed up by people who come in into the galleries. And um, 
Yeah, that's one of the works. Uh, the and there's, there's immediately also the way that it's lit. Yes. With three lights, there is this kind of suggestion as if you were either in a rehearsal a, space or, or on, on a stage. stage. Yeah, oh. it's kind of the whole room kind of feels like you're on a stage. I mean, I can do a more like direct description of the room, but maybe, I'll, yeah, maybe I'll describe the other like kind of discrete artworks in the space, even though it really is a kind of immersive piece. Um, so um, apart from surround sound, there are um, these pieces called uh, Institutional Seat, and there's three of them, kind of four, but you would have to find the fourth one. Um, and so it's institutional seat one through three, and I had asked the walker to give me the walker's standard gallery benches, the ones that you might find in the middle of an exhibition or, um, you know, with, you know, two-dimensional works or, you know, sculpture, or often you see them in immersive kind of gallery environments in front of moving image works. And every other gallery right now has, them. has those. Yeah. yeah. So I appropriated these works, you could say, or these, these standard seats, and then I had them modified for comfort. So they have like plywood backs and plywood risers that tilt the chairs slightly back, like thinking about, furniture, like thinking about seating design basically and what's actually comfortable. And they've been upholstered as well. And they're like much more comfortable for sitting and watching durational work, basically. Because oftentimes in institutions, there isn't really comfortable seating um, for that. It's also, this is a good time. I'm probably going to shout out a lot of people. But this is a really good time to shout out um, Shannon Finnegan, who's an amazing artist who also works a lot on um, access and institutional seating. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then uh, already many colleagues have said that they don't want to go back to the, <laughs> the old, the the old seats, bench. Yeah. So, um, but then there is, within the center of the space, there is a three-channel moving image work, yeah. which is called Lean's Reverses. Yes, it's, it's called Lean's Reverses. And it's, you can kind of think about it in two ways. Like I've been really conceptualizing it less as a moving image work at, than as like a sound work with captions. But you could also just think of it as like a three channel video in some ways. Um, but on each channel, what you see, and maybe one thing to say is everything that you see in the channels is exactly what you hear. So um, the first channel basically is a score that I wrote that is um, recited and spoken. So you can hear it. And it's also written as a caption on a black background. And this is, and then the next screen, this is complicated to explain, deceptively simple yet very complicated work. Uh, the next channel is uh, the captions of the sound of a dancer's movement. And then the third channel is uh, audio description of a dancer's performance. So maybe to explain it, it would be helpful to explain how I kind of constructed the work in some ways. Sure. So um, which kind of brings in some of my collaborators. Um, I wrote a score. Maybe it's worth also saying that for each of those three tracks, the sound is all put together into one. Yes. So everything is heard at the same, at the time. same time. And it's very much. Um, it's, it's very sculptural in that you take up very much the, the volume of the gallery by placing sound in a, in yeah. a sculptural Yeah, and way. also in terms of the sound design, uh, the, the, the sound of the dancer's movement and breath is like being carried and moved around the room um, in a kind of circular motion, basically. Um, but yeah, so I wrote this score and the score was kind of influenced by, you know, a lot of different things. It was a hodgepodge of things. It was me looking at Merce Cunningham performances and then writing my own AD and then adapting them. Um, I was looking at a lot of the language that like Steve Paxton used um, in terms of like generating con contact improv, you know, prompts basically, like really specific language around like just like space, time, duration, tempo, volume, you know, like these, these like really specific words that are like repeated often in prompts for movement. And then, yes, yeah, so I wrote the score, I recorded it. Then with my collaborator, John Herman, I gave him a recording of um, 
the score, which he listened to and responded to in real time with the reading of the score. And while he was dancing and improvising in response to the score, um, he was miked with lavalier mics all over his body, which picked up the sound of his movement and his breathing. Um, and then after that, I worked with Giselle Hughes um, on developing an audio description of that performance. So the whole piece is kind of different levels of translation based on like looking at dance and also like hearing dance, basically. Mm -hmm. And collaborators are very important to you. And what I was really struck by when we were working on the show and installing is that every day you had several phone calls <laughs> <laughs> with your friends, yeah. with artists, yeah. and you were workshopping the install of the show yeah. live with them. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about the importance of friendship and collaborators. Sure. I, I think there's also even like, maybe we'll talk about this more later, but there's like a kind of historical precedent. I'm, we'll talk about dance film and like dance films sort of influence on this but like there you know there's all there's so many incredible historic collaborations between dancers and filmmakers and painters and sculptors and um you know very much in that spirit and beyond that spirit like i wanted this project to be very collaborative but also most of my work is very collaborative and i make work you know from through in and with like extended disability arts community um, and lots of other artists who are like deeply important to me and whose work has impacted this work and um, we're sort of in a kind of collective like discursive practice of trying to answer similar or adjacent questions. Um, so yeah, I have to call my friends to help me <laughs> figure out how to make art and um, yeah, that feels very important. I also think just like as an artist, it's, it's really like, or I personally find it hard to be so like individuated, you know, like mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's like, there's my name and there's the title of the work. And right. it really like doesn't hold the complexity of how things get made, which is like inherently like dependent and like collaborative. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like I definitely lean pretty hard um, on my community when like producing. I feel weird using the word community. I just want to say friends, mm -hmm. like I lean on my friends. And that work. will that will really continue because the, because the show is co-commissioned with ICA Philadelphia and Nottingham Contemporary, and it will be on view through to I think 2024. Mm -hmm. And so, with each presentation, for example, institutional seat will be different in each location. Right. You will take existing furniture from those museums, but I imagine those iterative conversations will really continue well, because you'll be faced with totally different spaces. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think I will have to reconfigure the layout of the show, you know, in response to each site. That's mm. just like necessary, especially working with sound, you know, which is like, it's like when you're working with sound sculpturally, like there, it just like, it can't just like exist. It ha It has to have a kind of dynamic relationship to the architecture. So um, that will definitely change, yeah. Yeah. So one thing that you've talked a lot about is how your work, but specifically also Long Take, really touches upon the relationship between da blackness and disability. And I wonder if you could kind of talk a little bit more about that. Uh, yeah. Um, I think I've been thinking a lot about the relationship between accessibility and opacity and we traditionally think of access as this I've talked about this a lot but we traditionally think about access as this thing that's about transparency about like translation as this kind of trans like transparent process a kind of one-to-one -one. Um, but like through people who actually work in access and are thinking about art and accessibility it's like very clear that it's um, um, a lot more complex of a process and that it's kind of opaque and it has this relationship to opacity as well. And so I, I think like it, there is a relationship there in the sense that like access becomes like for me or the way I use it becomes a really interesting like tool of fugitivity as a black artist like mm -hmm. inside of arts institutions in some way. Like it is a way for us to like make contact with others inside of spaces that we might feel as, I wouldn't, I don't, I wouldn't go so far as to say hostile, but maybe like inhospitable, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily always accommodating. And um, yeah, so that's kind of what, 
yeah, that's that's the relationship I'm 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 sort of interested in is like the relationship between blackness and opacity, and then opacity and access, mm -hmm. um, and then also just like thinking a lot about access practices as like improvisational and thinking about that relationship to like you know black improvisation in sound and in dance and like and in life and like how do we think about um access as this thing that is like very like uh in real time responsive to like the present and current conditions and like how you know disabled people black and disabled people are like using whatever is it like whatever tools are avail available to like navigate in and through institutions and conditions that are inhospitable basically mm -hmm. so it's like kind of about this like creative practice of like adaptation modification which extends to like translation description right know, et cetera. this idea of this notion of fugitivity is also so important to the work in the sense that when i refer to it as a moving image work mm -hmm. That is in some ways unfair because as you were saying, it's, it can be, it's as valid a sound work as it is a moving image work. Yeah. So there's something about the work um, resisting to be confined to a particular mm -hmm. uh, medium. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think these questions of where is the work located and what role does translation play? Yeah. Um, but I wonder if maybe we could also kind of go back to some of those past histories that you were looking at because I remember and certainly with some of the work that you were making in the last year and a half you've been thinking a lot about the 60s and 70s um, for example the work Red that was mm -hmm. on view recently in um, Greater New York um, is very much pointing to the history of structural film and flicker films so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how cinema has also played a role in in making this exhibition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I I'm gonna get to. I think I want to start with performance, and then I'll like get to cinema or something. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about like the relationship between like dance and the gaze, and so like two works are coming to mind right now. Like thinking a lot about. Um, how we think of dance as something that is like observed, something to be seen. And I know like, you know, when uh, like Yvonne Rayner's instructions for Trio A are basically that the performer has to like constantly avert their gaze and like not make eye contact with the audience. And then like a kind of opposite example of that would be like performer audience mirror, you know, Dan Graham's work where it's basically about maintaining like constant contact, you know, between the performer and the spectator. Um, but it's always, and that work also has a, you know, a really interesting relationship to description, even though it's not about access, uh, you know, ostensibly. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, just like, it's so much about looking and seeing and like being in a body and like observing another body, um, which made me feel like, you know, thinking about access the way that I do, it's like, that's so strange because dance is something that is like, can be experienced in a wide variety of ways. And there might be another way to like, um, not simulate live performance, but just like present dance in a way that is not so, you know, as we say, ocular centric, or is not so visual or overly reliant on visuality in a certain way. Um, so that, I mean, in some ways, if, you, if I could condense the whole work into like one thing, I would just say like, I just wanted to make a a dance film w without an image. You right. Know? And, and, that's and when it. we started talking, I would go to colleagues and say, we're co-commissioning a moving image work that we'll never see. <laughs> right, so, exactly, yeah. But I think this is also something that we've talked about a little bit, This uh, and what this show gets at, which is a refusal to um, to obey by the, the, the standard way of experiencing, um, you know, in a gallery space that, you know, the visual is not the primary or default way of, of experiencing. And it reminds me of, we were, we were talking a little bit about who kind of, who was getting at that. And in some ways the show reminds me of people like Sturdevant who were exactly kind of questioning this. Mm -hmm. So where, mm -hmm. does, where does the work reside? reside yeah. I mean, I think uh, access is an interesting way to think through that because access makes artworks like necessarily like iterative. So like, you know, through the lens of access, 
like, you know, an artwork could be like a sound, an image, it could be a text. Uh, it could be like a tactile sensation. It could be like, you know, it could, it could literally just like travel through like multiple like sensorial modes basically. But like based on the premise of accessibility, that thing would still be the thing, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. So there's something, oh, I, I don't know. I don't want to go like this deep, but there's something about <laughs> like the ontology of art that I think is like really like challenged by accessibility as a framework that I'm interested in, mm -hmm. which is just kind of like, yeah, at, at this point, the work is kind of against medium specificity, basically. It's just like, sure, it could be this, it could be that. Like, it doesn't have to, a film doesn't have to look, doesn't have to literally look at all, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that's, yeah, that's something I'm like super, yeah, that's, that's what the work's about. And I wonder if we could, I mean, we have a show coming up at The Walker with Paul Chan, and he's mm -hmm. also an artist that I know you've been um, in dialogue with and inspired by. And, for Paul, he has this kind of continued resistance towards the norms of the moving image mm -hmm. and particularly the screen. And so I also wonder, you know, in this, also this time of just being completely um, restricted to often just being at home and constantly looking at the screen, there's mm -hmm. also something related there to the kind of last two years that we've been living through. Yeah, absolutely. I think also I've I've just been really like moved by the way performers have adapted to this moment and like rethought liveness in performance when we like literally can't be in physical space together. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I, I yeah, I, I think it's like the work in some ways, even though it's not like explicitly, I think a lot of artists are like making work in response to COVID, but are like, struggling to find the language to frame it because we can't, you know, because we're, we're still we're in it, in it yeah. you know? Um, but yeah, in some ways this work is about like, how can we find, like, is there a way, are there these like strange ways to build the kinds of connections, the kinds of modes of relation that we might have in live performance in a different way? Mm -hmm. Like, what does it mean to like sense like sonically and vis viscerally like, the feeling and the sound of like a dancer's like physical exertion or like you know what does it mean to be in a gallery that is also a stage to hear descriptions of another perf of to hear descriptions of a performance that have happened but because of the way that audio description works it also functions as like an imperative or as a direction or as a score itself and so um, thinking about yeah how the work kind of continues in the way that it like invites the spectator to participate, which actually takes us back to the title of the work, Long Take, which you know is sort of about this really basic thing in filmmaking, which is a, around duration and not cutting. And I was sort of like thinking about that idea, at, um, like in the context of art, which is like what does it mean for an artwork to kind of like continue beyond its like immediate presence in the gallery or something or how does like a performance then generate another performance or like a, a text then generate like movement or something like that and how these things just kind of yeah basically like what are the parameters of the work where does it end and which is also how you were approaching the score it was such a kept building on and on over on the writing that you were doing yeah mm -hmm. yeah exactly so kind of resisting fixity and trying to keep reshaping remaking yeah um I wonder if maybe it, we could share a little bit about the layers of um, access to the show. And yesterday we had a walkthrough with um, Dan from Blind Ink, uh, who's generating uh, an audio description of the experience of the show. So I think it would be interesting to share a little bit like what that conversation looked like. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I think obviously a lot of people can't come to museums and, you know, for lots of reasons, mostly around access and especially in the pandemic around like being high risk and um, we're, yeah, there are things that are inaccessible about coming here. So uh, we wanted to find a way to extend the work online and part of that is basically a written transcript of the exhibition. Um, that includes the texts, you know, from the captions and the audio description and the score, but then also is like a description of the space. And it was kind of an amazing conversation with this person, Dan from Blind Ink, because he's so um, <clears throat> just like acutely focused and has so much experience with like the kind of language that gets used to describe exhibition spaces, even the way he talked about 
um, how one might like explain the sound as something that like starts in the center and then like ripples outwards or um, yeah, just like really tuned into like describing different sensorial experiences. Um, so yeah, I'm feeling good about just like having that as a possibility for people who can't be here or who want to access the work in a different way. And I would argue that like that text transcript is as much the work as coming in and sitting in the seat and being mm -hmm. in the space. So I feel like we should qualify what you were saying in terms of institutional seat number four, <laughs> because right. in the gallery there are three. Right. But this show has kind of moved beyond the gallery a little bit. And um, when we were working together on finalizing the placement, uh, you made the call that four seats were too many. And so one has gone out into a public space in our building. Do you want it to be a surprise or do you want to share a little uh, bit like how we... Maybe I won't say where it is. I'll just say it's like a kind of weird like interstitial space where things happen at the museum that aren't looking at art. And it doesn't have a label. And it doesn't have a label. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's just there. I like, I feel like I've gotten into this practice and also like kind of shout out to Park MacArthur because I think she does this a lot too. Um, but you know, like it's really, um, like it's really nice to leave things behind in institutions. Like I don't have anything like super intellectual to say about this, except that I just really enjoy um, like hiding things in institutions and seeing how long they last mm -hmm. basically and we should also mention that there's another work on view which is not oh, technically yeah. part of long take but it's a work that came into the collection about a year or so ago and it's called the conspiracy um which it's been interesting watching people experience it because some people notice it and some people do not and it will be the same i think with the bench mm -hmm. with the institutional seat number four mm -hmm. so i wonder if maybe you could talk a little bit about a conspiracy and how it looks and feels here. Sure, yeah. Um, well, I also just want to like shout out Peter Hanna, who's like a preparator here, who does amazing work and like just made like the most beautiful install of that piece I've ever seen. Um, yeah, it's basically installed in this corridor between like, you know, the kind of central visitors, you know, desk and the the garage that one would like walk from the garage to the visitor's desk uh, if you parked your car. So um, yeah, it's also in this hallway and I don't know how many there are. 48. Okay. <laughs> There's 48 um, DOM noise machines installed in the ceiling in a grid. Um, and uh, they, yeah, they basically emit like white noise and I mean, I can like talk, talk, talk about the work. Okay. Um, yeah, they basically emit white noise. Um, it's an, it's a kind of like an electromechanical thing, which is really important for me. Like a lot of white noise machines now use like a digital file, whereas this is literally just like a fan inside of a metal box. And that's what produces the sound. And people use these in a lot of different ways, like to, go to sleep or to help concentrate or they'll put them in like a baby's nursery to sort of like mask other noises and help, yeah, kind of calm things down. Um, I know them primarily from <clears throat> going to therapy because they're often used in therapist offices as a kind of way to use, they use sound sculpturally actually, which is that like the noise machine sits outside of the door and um, it produces this kind of like wall of white noise. Um, that I, since it's been installed i've started noticing it everywhere oh oh you, the you see machines. them everywhere yeah. yeah so i just got hyper fixated on that i was like thinking about the audio describer and i was like oh, i could describe myself i'm doing this weird gesture with my <laughs> hand right now um so yeah um yeah it's used sculpturally in this way to to create like privacy so that if you're having these like intimate conversations in a therapist's office people walking through the hallway won't be able to hear what's happening so um, I've sort of installed them in this way and what it allows is for people to move through the space and have conversations with each other without it being necessarily heard by others, which I really love. It's kind of like a, I don't know, like an anti-surveillance device or something. Um, and like thinking about, yeah, the misuse and misappropriation of like wellness and health tools. Um, I think the marketing copy that the company issued for that product yeah. is something like provides a tranquil sanctuary or something right. ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the work in some ways is about also 
kind of like having a fugitive relationship to institutions, which is like, what does it mean to be here and to be hidden in some way or unheard or finding these like pockets of um, community or collectivity or conspiracy inside of what feel like totalizing systems. Um, the private and the public, yeah, how the two come together. Exactly, and having that kind of conflate. And I think that also comes a lot from some earlier thinking in my work that, that really just has to do with like chronic illness and like, yeah, the kind of strange occupation that chronic illness, uh, I mean, times have changed, things are a little different so maybe need to rethink this but like mm -hmm. yeah thinking about how chronic illness is often seen and, and and understood as a kind of private moment and how we've like classically con like conceived of politics particularly in like an Arendtian mode or something as like y having to appear in the public sphere which I think that then proposes like you know challenges from chronic illness like thinking about disability and thinking about how we might conceive of politics as something that is not about appearing on the public sphere like mm -hmm. how can we reframe um, politics around like not around this distinction between you know public and private mm -hmm. and I, I want to ask you a little bit about um, this issue particularly in relation to the work that you've been making and how the work has been talked about because uh -huh. even in the time that We've worked together, some of the language around uh, the work that you make has changed. And so I'm thinking, you know, a conspiracy, which is I think from 2017. 17, yeah. And then I'm thinking of work that maybe our um, local audiences might know, which has been on view here previously in Sickness and Study, which is a work that consists of plexiglass objects under which are images they appear as if they seem to be iPhone screens and on these images we see you holding the book that you happen to be reading at the time but also receiving a blood um, transfusion. And so in those works where we have a kind of maybe more heightened reference to chronic illness, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but that has I think really shifted sure, in yeah. recent work. So can you talk about a little bit about that hmm. change? Yeah. Um I mean, you're off script. Um, <laughs> we don't have to talk no, about it. No, no, it's a to. really good, I mean, it's a really good question, you know. Um, I think over time I have really just, it does also relate to fugitivity, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're just going to keep talking about that, which is just that, like, um, I'm really trying to, I'm thinking here of Jordan Lord's work, because I think Jordan references capture a lot, but, you know, like, really, like, thinking about ways of, of kind of, like, evading capture, basically, mm -hmm. and um, some of the ways to do that are to, like, not, or to, like, kind of shy away from or move against certain, um, you know, um, how do I say this? Uh, just like intelligibility or like legibility in certain kinds of ways. Um, how might we be able to like communicate some of these things, um, not through representation, but really through like form or like <laughs> aesthetics or experience. experience or just like vibe or mm -hmm. like feel, you know, that there's like all of these different ways of understanding something. And also I think it just has to do with the fact that like, I'm not so, my, uh, my understanding of chronic in illness and disability is so collective that I feel like my personal experience, while it's deeply important to me, it, obviously it's my life, it's also like, you know, it's, it's such a collective one that, and, and of course I'm, I love work that is deeply personal and like, has, you know, so many works like that have changed my life. And also in my personal interests, like I'm really more interested in how like the body is like, interpolated by like institutions and like forces and systems and et cetera. And like, I don't know if we can necessarily have those conversations or there are other ways to think about that without imaging the body mm -hmm. in a certain way, if that makes sense. I think you're describing the, the problem of over determining the lens through which a work and uh, the person who made that work right, yeah. is read. Sure. And so how to resist that is yeah. a really valid. And that's obviously like raced, classed, gendered, you know, um, in, in a lot of different ways in terms of like whose, you know, whose work gets read a certain way and whose mm -hmm. work doesn't. Like, so I, I, it's, it's complex, but I think it's something that I've like 
definitely very like self-consciously like navigated as an artist. Mm. Um, we're coming towards the 40 minute mark. I want to make sure that um, we have time for questions. Cool. Um, I'm, I really hope that anyone listening can come and see the exhibition. It's on view for quite some time. It's, um, it's a really powerful show. I'm going to uh, field some of the questions here. Um, so uh, there is a question here from Elizabeth Flinch, um, which I'm going to read out for you. Mm -hmm. I was able to spend time in the space today, oh, cool. which is amazing to have had that opportunity before hearing you speak. As a performer with a brain injury, I was moved to take off my coat and boots and follow the verbal cues as instructions for movement in the lit area. The spinning cues made it difficult for me, but the piece urged me to keep going in a beautiful way. I kept wondering if I was going to get in trouble with the gallery attendants. <laughs> <laughs> my question is, do you intend for people to move in the space like this? How do you see that as part of the work if it happens allowed or not? That's a great question. Um, I don't get to make the decisions. I don't work here, <laughs> so I don't know. But I mean, you know, the, the you know this work is about this complex relationship between like instruction and description, and it actually really conflates the two. You know, I really think it's like highly interpretive. I don't know if I can say much more because I really don't like over determining people's experiences of my work. It's like if you if that was your experience of it, then that's what it was and that's what it is and remains to be, you know. Um, but yeah, I think in some ways the work is about conflating kind of like these other works I referenced, um, you know, conflating, complicating uh, and trying to understand the relationship between like performer and spectator. And you know, by ambiguate and like that gets very seriously ambiguated in the space because you're like sitting on a bench in the middle of a stage, basically. Mm -hmm. um, uh, thanks, Mackenzie. Feel free to use the Q and A button for any questions. Um, I think for me also it was interesting to hear some initial responses to the show yesterday, which was we we talked about this, but some teenagers who were intimidated. Right. by the experience of being in the space. <laughs> so, and then earlier today, we saw, I saw children running around. So I think it's, you're inviting that. There's so yeah. much room. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it is an invitation. I just, yeah, I don't want to be prescriptive about what that, you know, what that movement is, but it is like an invitation to, um, yeah, to respond to it as you see fit, whether it is description that you are listening to, to get a sense of like this event, this performance that happened, or whether that description then is actually, like I said, a kind of imperative and instruction for for you and for your movement, mm -hmm. basically. Um, we'll wait for a few more questions if they come in, but I also was curious, one thing that maybe you didn't um, talk about, which is that actually the format of the uh, captions in Lean's Reverses is, is very similar to subtitles on a TV. Yeah. As as if you were watching oh, TV, yeah. and also, I mean, televisions and just um, you know, commercial television has featured in your work quite a bit mm -hmm. with extended stay, which is a, a hospital arm that would be attached to, uh, to a, a hospital bed with a TV on it. There's also I can't remember the title, but the um, the flaming log. <laughs> yeah, I think that work is. You mean, oh, the physical work or the, the no, video? The, no, the video. Oh, yeah. that's. I think that work is called Untitled. Untitled. You'll log, yeah. But um, I wonder if maybe you could talk about just what TV means in terms yeah, of your work. Yeah, totally. And even more specifically in relationship to this project, like, um, you know, a as an artist, I have also been an art worker. I had a day job at EAI, Electronic Arts Intermix. Shout out to them. Uh, and when I was working there, you know, we had just taken on like this huge sort of like conservation, restoration, archival project of, you know, Merce Cunningham's dance films, basically, collaborations with Charles Atlas, etc. And, you know, I really became interested in this genre. And part of my interest in it also is related to like older ideas of access from the 60s and 70s that came through like the transition to like video from film and how like video made art making or just like any kind of documentation so much more accessible. 
um, <clears throat> at least like financially. And so, um, you know, that was the idea about all these like dance film collaborations and, and was basically like, oh, let's make dance on camera and we can put it on television and then everybody will get to see dance. You know, like this idea that like TV was this like amazing, like, you know, democratic. democratic like forum, this place where we could really like explode art and make it so expansive and accessible. And like, in some ways I was sort of interested in that and then being like, okay, well, that is access. And also here are some considerations that weren't made and mm. I want to think through them around access, right? Um, so yeah, TV is really important to me. I sometimes feel kind of stunned like around this kind of question because I'm just like, I just love television like pretty <laughs> uncritically. Um, and, um, and I'm interested in its history and it, yeah, it's a, it's a big part of, part of my work, particularly mm -hmm. around that, that moment and thinking about the relationship between like, like, you know, magnetic tape video and like television and like this, uh, this like really specific art historical moment that was like really transformative in terms of moving image work. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a question from Michael Hansen. Would you recommend any other artists or authors related to the topic of institutional accessibility? Uh, sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, um, I don't want to be reductive about anybody's practices, but I can name a few artists who I think um, speak to this kind of thing. So, um, Park MacArthur, Constantina Zavitsanos, um, Cameron Rowland, uh, Shannon Finnegan, who I had mentioned, um, Brothers Sick, which is a collaborative project. Um, you know, Jaron, who's my performer, Jaron Herman, Joselia Hughes, um, Alice Shepard. I mean, honestly, I, I could literally just like go on, go on and on, but there's like a lot of artists who are really, Jordan Lord, there's a lot of artists who are like really deeply invested in questions of access and like radical access and how that is, um, is and will continue to be like really, uh, uh, I don't know, transformative. And there's accessibility in the arts. Oh my? Which, yeah. Which oh yeah. Which is irrelevant. Sure, yeah. I wrote an access guide for small scale arts nonprofits or organizations called Accessibility in the Arts. It's available online. It's promiseandapractice.net, I believe. Um, a few questions. So, um, from Simi Linton, you oh. used. Uh, Hi, Simi. You used term disability arts earlier. Wonder if you could talk about the role of access in this domain, genre, field, or however you refer to it. In disability arts. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to say, like, I, I don't want to say that dis disability arts is always going to have, like, a relationship to access, but I don't even want to overdetermine what that even means, right? Like, there's just a lot of different people making a lot of different kind of, kind of work. Can you repeat the question? Sure. Um, you used term disability arts yeah. earlier. Wonder if you could talk about the role of access in this domain, genre, field, or however you refer to it. Sure. Yeah, I just think that there are a lot of, um, I mean, this community is like expansive and exists in different pods and pockets, you know, all over the world. And um, I think people are thinking about access in different ways and in different places. But I think disability arts as a framework is basically really about like, um, like cross disability solidarity, actually, which is something that I think outside of, you know, communities of disabled people doesn't really get talked about, but it's about people who, whose like points of access might sometimes like, ca like contraindicate each other, finding ways of like being together and, and making work. So, um, yeah, I, I guess that's what I would, I would say about that is like, it's just kind of about finding ways to like be together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, a question from Kunal Patra. You mentioned the dome white noise machines in regards to surveillance. Do these machines in your work symbolizes, symbolizes a sort of way to fight state surveillance? If you don't mind, could you also speak a little bit about your hourglass works? Oh, cool. Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I said the surveillance thing in passing, but I, yeah, I think what I'm interested in is like how we can like retool and like repurpose objects towards like other more radical means than they were like intended for basically 
Um, and so I guess when I say anti-surveillance, I just mean like, yeah, that there's like a kind of innate power in like, not silencing, but in like being able to like hide underneath white noise basically. Um, and that that might be useful politically in some ways to not be heard or to be able to have conspiratorial conversations in public. Um, and yeah, so that's that. And then in terms of the hourglass piece, I have a yeah, piece called Free Radicals and um, <clears throat> it's basically an hourglass and it's filled with um, like limestone and granite dust from a stone quarry that I grew up next to in Exurb, Exurbian, Exurban, Philadelphia. Um, and I think with that work, I was at the time just thinking a lot about, it's also a remediated uh, Superfund site. Um, and there are, you know, across this country kind of, I mean, I, I hate to say like, anyway, yeah. Anyway, across this country, um, like there's a really high incidence of Superfund sites adjacent to black neighborhoods basically, and I, I kind of wanted to make a work just like using that material and thinking about its kind of like ephemeral presence throughout my life and kind of like the <clears throat> strange ways that we're able to like map like physical change in response to the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have a question from Hannah Norali and Linton Talbot. Oh, hi. Uh, when talking about fugitivity and the idea of evading capture, I'm wondering to what extent you think this is possible inside the museum. Fred Moten talks about complicity a lot, that one can't necessarily rise above it but forge a different type of radical complicity. Does this resonate at all with your works, particularly a conspiracy installed in the Walker's permanent displays? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think you kind of answered it. Like something I think a lot about is this like particular phrase that Fred Moten says about being like in and not of institutions. And it's like a very subtle distinction. And yeah, I think that's like how I try to kind of operate. Like it's, um, yeah, these uh, systems, institutions, et cetera, can feel totalizing, yet there are these like I don't know, pockets of grace and radicality available like everywhere in life, you know? Uh, from Martin German, what is for you the relation between institutional access and the notion of vibe as you were describing it? <laughs> um, vibe, also shout out Konstantina Zavitsanis, who I think were like, I don't know if people think about their work this way, but for me, their work is very much about like vibe, <laughs> like vibe and like vibration, you know, like these like thresholds of like sensory experience that are like beyond like, um, yeah, beyond like hearing. They're like about feeling in some way. And um, I think, yeah, vibe for me is like, I guess when I think about vibe, it like brings me back to this question of collectivity and like, what is the point of access? Which we're like circling back to the beginning of the conversation, which is like, access is not about increased transparency to an object, to a thing, to a text, you know, accessibility, accessibility is about collectivity. It's about like producing a thing that can be experienced like with others. And so I think that's what I mean when I say vibe, where it's like, this is the thing that has to be prioritized over like transparency in mm -hmm. some ways, which is like, you know, a lot of times when <coughs> disabled people try to come together, it's like really challenging because of these like conflicting kind of access needs. But like at the end of the day, it's like, I'm gonna give like a really practical example, which is like, you could try to organize a meeting for like, <coughs> for disabled organizers or artists or something and like you know the hours the meetings like two hours and by the time all of the access is set up like there's like 15 minutes left for the actual meeting but it's like it doesn't really matter because the whole point is just like oh cool we got together like that in and of itself is like such a radical and amazing like necessary part of life and such an incredible like such an incredibly important practice it's like fuck the meeting you know like this is the point of access um so um, yeah, and in that way, it's like structural, right? Like it's kind of like a, about moving around the thing and like mm -hmm. what are the, um, 
protocols and tools that make like a thing possible. Right. Um, we have just a couple more. A uh, question from Drew Maud Griffin. Can you speak more about this movement towards intelligibility as a way of evading capture and how this interacts with access? How do you evade capture but still remain accessible to an audience who may not be within the arts field or frequent spaces like the Walker? I am so appreciative of your wisdom and this word fugitivity, which deeply encompasses many aspects of being disabled. Mm. Yeah, I think you're talking about the accessibility of the work in some ways, or that I think that's what that question is about. And like, I'm gonna like think talk about another work to kind of respond to it, like this piece that you had mentioned before, extended stay, which is um, <clears throat> a, has a hospital television monitor on like this articulating like arm mount that comes out from the wall, and it's um, basically playing cable television for 24 hours and it's been programmed to change the channel every minute and 30 seconds so it's like a self-surfing television and you know it presents itself in some ways as like a kind of classic ready-made but also could be thought of as a kinetic artwork because of the television functions as like movement in some ways and like there are lots of ways to talk about it but honestly the people who i felt had like the most profound or like who understood the work best when they approached it were people who were like oh I know this object I have like an intimate relationship with this object right so it can be framed art historically or it's just like if you've been in a chemo infusion suite if you've spent any kind of time in that location you will recognize the object and you will understand its association you'll understand how much different of a media experience that is than like what we classically think of as an experience of media in a museum mm -hmm. and like the difference between like a hospital and a museum as like institutions and so i guess what i'm trying to say is like i think that what needs to be recognized is recognized by the people who need to recognize it. And one last question, mm -hmm. again from Elizabeth Flinch. You've mentioned Merce Cunningham a few times, and I'm wondering if there are any other dancers who excite you or may have influenced this work. Mm, that's a good question, yeah. Um, well, Jaron, obviously. Um, somebody who I really want to cite is Kayla Hamilton, who's a dancer working today who, you know, we had many conversations as I worked on this project. Um, she has a dance performance called Nearly Sighted that's really amazing. That's also sort of about performance and like creatively engaging audio description. Um, Alice Shepard is also, um, you know, a black disabled dancer doing really incredible work that I'm like deeply influenced by. And then maybe more historically, somebody I thought a lot about was Blondell Cummings, who, you know, had various associations with like that earlier generation of dancers, had like been in one of Yvonne Rayner's films, but, you know, had made this kind of amazing uh, dance work that like took what we saw as like kind of like, I don't know, like white modernist, like in like modern dance interests in like pedestrian gestures and sort of like, really transformed it because the work was so much about like domestic labor and domestic work and care work and mm. caring and trying to like mimic and 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 like repeat those gestures over and over again and see what they produced so i've been thinking a lot about her her work actually so those were some of the people i'd mentioned well thank you so much carolyn for sharing with us um some of the stories around this exhibition but your work more generally thank you to everyone who have tuned in and uh, asked questions and been here today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Pavel, and thank you everyone for coming and to the access workers and to this talk show that's been set up <laughs> and yeah, thank you. <laughs>